these are interesting days indeed. Uh, actually, the newspaper headlines talk about the stuff that is causing the problems or the results of the fact that we did not look at some of the key issues that I hope to be conveying to you. How many of you are sympathizing with what's going on in the streets today? Okay, I actually believe it's about 100%. All right, the key message is why is it that monetary democracy is necessary and what I hope to show you that it's also available. But we need to get out of the box, the box that has been a very well established box. Actually parts of it go back 5,000 years to the origins of patriarchy. <laughs> And that's what we're going to have to deal with. How many of you have had at least one course of economics? Not also 100%. So you're going to have the answers to my questions. Let's say so. Five years ago, when I asked this question in the United States, I usually get that answer. How many of you still believe that? Zero. Some learning has been going on. Is it the Fed that creates money? Is it someone else? <laughs> All right. Okay. Interesting. The last ones have it. See, there's someone's there. Every yen you see, there's someone's there. Government, corporate, or private. So, let me put it slightly negatively. If everybody was reimbursing the debts, there would not be a penny left. And actually, we'd have a big hole because the interest was not created. So it would actually, the money would more than disappear. We are competing for paying for interest, which is not created. When you reimburse interest on anybody's debt, on your debt, you're using someone else's principle. So we are in an interesting game here. And by the way, people who believe that we can actually have stable economic system in the sense that the no growth model is mathematically impossible with the current money system. Mathematically impossible. Okay? Because the debt would not that exist would not be able to be paid back with interest. Everything would fall apart. So we're obliged to grow as long as we're in this money system. Now, how is it that everybody in America uses dollars? I mean, why is everybody using pounds in England and rubles in Russia? Is there somewhere a law that says, and a policeman that checks whether when you make an exchange, you've used the national currency? Is it illegal for two businesses to exchange something else than dollars in America? Anyone believe that? A few, okay. Well, in fact, there's laws that intimate in that direction that if you have debt, you know, you cannot refuse to be paid back in, in the national currency. That's the only law that exists. But in fact, the real secret is this. Everybody needs to pay back taxes, right, normally. And the taxes, the government has decreed that taxes can only be paid in a currency that the government cannot create. So, it's shooting itself in the foot here, right? You're obliging to use a currency that only can be created by the private sector through bank debt. By the way, what's interesting, this is worldwide, eh? under the Soviet system, they did the same thing. 
The only difference was that the banks were controlled by the government. But the system was identical. So, now, what is money? <laughs> um, given that you're all taking courses of economics, you at least have, well, the two things I would suggest you notice, that some of the things I just told you were not told to you, right? Which is kind of fundamental. However, that is, you've heard, that definition, right? Medium of exchange, measure, standard of measurement, and store of value. That's what in every single textbook of economics. In fact, that's not what money is. That's what money does. You understand the distinction? Assume in the 19th century that someone had decreed that the word transport does not exist. That the word transport is replaced by horses. Would anybody ever invent cars or bicycles? You'd only have to perfect of the horses. There's not even a word to talk about it. So you start seeing the box that is mentally built here, semantically built. We're trained to believe that the only way of managing an economy is with a single currency. And that's a very peculiar currency which is created with debt. And it's presented as being value neutral, right? In fact, we'll see itself. It's a competitive game. For those who or trying to deal with money, you need to have a pretty masculine approach to things, whether you're a woman or not. Okay? There is a bias built in. And we're blind to that bias. We assume it's human nature. In fact, my claim is that our money programs us into specific directions. And that's the programming that we have to become aware of. Now, here's my definition of money. It's an agreement. It's like a marriage, political party, nationality. It's not an object. It's not a thing. It's something that lives in our, idea, in our heads. Now, what's interesting, of course, with an agreement as a definition, when an agreement stops working, you can actually change it. The day that someone invented marriage, the next morning, someone invented a divorce, right? So, by defining it that way, at least we can start opening the possibility of looking at what we're doing here. It's an agreement for a community, usually it's a nation state. Since the last 200 years, it has been the nation state that has been uh, the framework. The United States is an exception because of another agreement. Bretton Woods in 1945, where it was supposed to become a global currency, the reserve currency. So it's an agreement for a community to use something standardized as a medium of exchange. Now, let me ask you a last question. How many of you have already used currencies other than national currencies? Anybody? Oh, a lot. Good for you. Good for you. Anybody who is not? Okay. Have you used... Miles? Miles? Yes? Never used Miles? You see my point? Have you used uh, Sears points? <laughs> you see? Actually, we have been using multiple currencies all the time. But we've been using them for a long time, for the last 20, 30 years actually. But we've been doing it for very, very I would say, limited purposes. The miles convince you to take the same airline a second time or a third time. That won't really save a hell of a lot in humanity or make a big difference economically or socially. What I'm going to be talking about is using this technology for other purposes that are actually more meaningful. But the technology exists. And they're not marginal. Okay, they're not marginal. Uh, I mean, the miles... There are 15 trillion miles today in circulation. I mean, 15,000 billion. That's more than dollar bills, by the way. 
Okay? So this can be big. You don't have to think that those currencies necessarily have to be local, little, you know, kind of mom and pop things. They can be, but they don't have to be. All right. Twelve years ago, I published a book called The Future of Money. And it is today I can tell you that uh, I can conclude that it's no fun to be right. <laughs> it's no fun to be right when it's about being right about suffering of other people. What I forecast at that point is where we are now. I said there were four megatrends which are predictable and which make impossible, I underline, impossible to, we cannot resolve these issues within the current monetary paradigm. That's my key point. The first one, well known, is age wave. When Bismarck invented pensions, the life expectancy in Germany was 48. So we're placing it at 65, you know, we were on safe territory. Uh, we're going to 25% of the population getting more than 65 in the next 10 years, 15 years, in the OECD countries. It won't work. Okay, we know that. Another one is the information revolution. We heard all the good things about the information revolution. They forgot to tell you the little science aspect. That's also the end of the industrial age. And the idea of a job, the word of a job in English, was invented in the industrial age. The word did not exist before the industrial age. It is an activity you do to get money. You have work. Work is a very old word in all languages. The work of God or the work of you know, your lifetime or the magnus opus, whatever. That's something you do because you're passionate about it. Because that's why you're here on this planet. Uh, but jobs are an industrial age concept. And we now have the technologies to make sure that we can have natural, we can have economic growth without creating jobs. This is true on a micro level. When Macy's had its best year ever, it fired 40,000 people. Same thing with the telecom industry. You don't need people to grow. Now, the China phenomenon, which is now blamed for unemployment, I'm sorry to say, is just an accelerator. What would have happened over 20 years is going to happen over 10. But you would not have avoided the problem. We are in a post-industrial age. Now, so how will we invent a way of providing activity with a system where we don't need human labor? Uh, someone once said that, well, human labor in, as an input in the economy will go where the horses went at the beginning of the industrial age. Well, with the horses, you could let them die off. What do we do with people? Or seven billion. The next one is well known to this community. Although 12 years ago there were some people still questioning, and there's still about a couple of people on the media that I keep saying that all this is kind of not happening. Climate change and biodiversity extinction is a connection with money. Why? If you have any currency that has positive interest rates, and remember, money cannot be created unless it's a loan, so therefore it has interest built in. We'll discount the future into oblivion. I would claim there's not a single uh, nuclear power station that would have been ever built had you not discounted the future cash flow of the cost. Anything over 20 years is down to zero. The garbage will be there 20 years later even if you discount it to zero today. So 
Okay? And the final one is monetary instability. At the time when I published it, the answer was, well, that happens in funny countries, developing countries. I'm sorry to say, I told then, and I repeat today, it's not true. We're dealing with a systemic issue. And systemic issues don't choose countries. So these are the four megatrends. Two messages. I have defied for 20 years in my different audiences anybody to provide me solutions to any one of those four megatrends within the monetary paradigm. I have gotten zero answers in 12 years' time. So we will not be able to address these issues if we stay with our head in the box. Second, and the good news is, if you're willing to put your head out of the box, all these four megatrends have a solution. I'm not going to be dealing with all of them. That's an old book. <laughs> but I will give you uh, examples of some of the pieces. In other words, the time was available 12 years ago. Yeah. Nothing has been done. We stayed in the monetary paradigm, believing that we need to solve every problem with a single currency of this type that we have today. Well, I don't think we have another 12 years to go. Actually, most people believe that we have. We rather resolve these problems between now and 2020, or after that, the boomers <laughs> will have died out <laughs> because they have not found a way of surviving. And the climate change, the positive feedback loops will take on their own, whether we stop emitting carbon dioxide or not. So we have a deadline here. And the time is now. Good. That strange idea that we need more than one currency, we can prove it scientifically. That's the first point I will make. Let's first look at instability. I find it very interesting that when you talk about monetary instability or financial problems, invariably you talk about the last one. Okay? I'm sorry. You will not find a systemic issue by looking at the last one. Look at all of them. And all of them is quite impressive. We have had 145 banking crashes since 1970. We have had 204 monetary collapses since 1970. We have had 72 sovereign debt crises. Greece is number 73. Okay? If that's 421 systemic problems in 40 years. 10 per year. More than 10 per year. How many do we need? How many more do we need before we need to look that we have a systemic issue? And even before 1970, because some people say, well, that's all because of Nixon, he changed the system in 1970, everything was fine before. Well, no. There have been 48 total meltdowns since the beginning of the industrial age, since the beginning of or today's money systems. This is a statistic from Kindleberg. By the way, if I say something that is not understood, don't wait for the end. It is my responsibility to be understood. I can find ways of different languages or different types of conveying the message. So I'm not going to request from you to stretch to a new vocabulary or a whole new series of concepts. It's my duty to be understood. Now, if you understand me and disagree, let's please deal with that at the end, otherwise we'll never get there. Okay? <laughs> Good. There are now five peer-reviewed articles being published in five different journals, in different domains, that prove what I'm going to be telling you. This is not my opinion. Okay? What we're dealing with is something as fundamental as gravity. Actually, something as fundamental as the circular law of the thermodynamics, okay? which is considered more fundamental than. So denying this, uh, what I'm going to be telling you, my suggestion would be 
let's go to the fundamentals here. I'm not going to explain the whole thing. The articles are available uh, for those who are interested, including the mathematical demonstration of it. But I'm going to just give you the essence of it. It uses complexity theory. Okay? And it shows that the very reason that the system is systemically unstable is the monoculture. The fact that we're trying to do everything with a single system. That is the cause, the systemic cause. So unless we get out of that box, no chance. We may reduce the frequency. I'm not claiming that we can't reduce the frequency, but I'm claiming you will not get rid of the problem. Now, the work that I'm referring to is based on data. And the data was gathered by uh, my friend and colleague, Robert Dulanovic, from the University of Maryland. He spent his entire life measuring what happens in the natural ecosystem, right? The natural ecosystem is a complex flow network. You have the sun, plants growing, animals eating plants, animals eating animals, we eating it all, and that's kind of where the biomass goes through your system. So it's a complex flow network. So he has gathered data in hundreds of ecosystems. There are thousands, tens of thousands of ecosystems. By you have the Amazon is one, the Serengeti Plain, but it's also a little puddle the size of a dish in a, in a backyard. All these things are natural ecosystems. Now they have one thing in common, right? They? Because they're natural, they are actually sustainable. If they were not sustainable, they would not be there. They would not appear. They would not survive. So here we have an extraordinary range of thousands of natural ecosystems which have in common to be sustainable. What else do they have in common is the question that we raised. And the answer is it requires a balance between two emerging properties. One of them is efficiency, a concept very familiar with all of us. Efficiency is the volume of what flows through your network per unit of time. For example, in natural ecosystems, we are dealing with grams per square meter per year of biomass flowing through your system. That's what Bob has measured. Um, and the other thing is resilience. Resilience is the capacity for a system to adapt, to change, to survive an attack, a change of environment, a drought, uh, whatever, a disease, and still maintain its integrity. Of course, one thing can die and disappear, but then they're not sustainable, right? So, Furthermore, these two emerging properties come from two structural variables, and the important work of the word of this structural here, because that is what will make it extrapolatable to any other system. We're not dealing with ecology of natural systems, we're dealing with complex flow networks. And the, the structural variables are diversity and interconnectivity. Diversity, understand what it is in an ecosystem, right? And interconnectivity is who eats what, okay? So let's give an example. This is a low diversity system. Very efficient, by the way. Very efficient. Uh, however, one match and it's all gone, right? It's not terribly resilient, right? And this is a very sympathetic, very nice looking animal, very popular, and it will disappear because it only eats one type of bamboo. That's a mistake, okay? <laughs> So, in other words, no interconnectivity. Now, that's a rainforest, high diversity, and here is a squirrel in Central Park in New York, and they eat anything <laughs> that they have never seen in nature. <laughs> Cookies and, you know, strawberries and uh, even pieces of carton, you know, whatever. They will survive. They have been surviving sustainably in this thing without ever getting out of the... <laughs> they've never been able to get out of the Central Park, right? So this is the two variables. 
So you can start seeing the relationship between diversity and interconnectivity and the structural results of efficiency and resilience. Now, here is actually the mathematical boom. It's a simplified form. This is a pedagogic thing. Actually, it's a four-dimensional object. So you have sustainability. Now, we're really dealing, just give you, uh, uh, let me emphasize that. This is the first time in these five articles that we can measure sustainability of a complex system with a single metric. Today, until now, until this work, which has been developed in the last six years, you, when you talk about sustainability, you get into a notion of vagueness. Right? You never heard of someone saying, this is 97.5% sustainable. Right? And it's therefore better than one that's only 67 and three, three quarters. Right? Now we can. We can do that. Okay? With this methodology. With this. Now, you have sustainability on the vertical axis, and here you have two of the dimensions, which is diversity and interconnectivity. Now, in order to have efficiency, you actually have to reduce the diversity. Efficiency is usually pushed by streamlining, get rid of the secondary stuff, right? Now, there is one optimal balance, and we're lucky, actually. You know, this is, you could have a system that actually develops multiple with optimum points, and therefore we've got more complicated to deal with. No, we have actually mathematically proven that any complex flow network has only one optimal range. Now, if you are below that, you can push efficiency, but you will have it at the cost of brittleness. Now, be careful. Diversity and interconnectivity should not be pushed too far. There is a possibility of not only be too efficient, which is what we're talking about here, but also be too resilient. If you go too far, you get stagnation. Nothing happens anymore. It just sits there. There's no dynamic anymore. So we need to find a range. And here is the range. All natural ecosystems have fallen within a very specific range around a window of viability around that optimum. That's a breakthrough. Now, you say, well, that's all very nice, but, you know, that's God's work. You know, this is natural ecosystems. What has to do with money? We'll get there. Diversity and interconnectivity are structural variables. The emphasis I gave already was structural. I.e., it doesn't matter what flows through your system. The findings remain valid. So, let's give an example. We have biomass in an ecosystem. The electrons in the electrical distribution system. Remember the big blackouts? The big blackouts in New York and you know, kind of half of the country, the whole part of northern Germany. Why in these countries? Guess what? They were the most developed technologically. They were pushing efficiency too far. The whole thing went down. And at the time, by the way, engineers didn't understand. This was coming out of the blue. They did not know that you can be too efficient. Right? Now, information in immune systems. Our immune system is a from plus flow network. AIDS and cancer are immune system problems. We have not found yet how to deal with them. And finally, money in an economy. I'm defying anybody to explain why an economy is not a complex flow network in which money circulates. By the way, the GNP per capita, which is our standard stuff, what we're measuring, is the quantity of money exchanges that have occurred in the economy over a year. It's exactly the same equivalent to the TST in ecological systems. And we know now that it is not good enough to push that. That's just measuring efficiency. You're not taking into account resilience. Here's what happens in a natural ecosystem. Efficiency is important, but it's about a third of importance of the resilience. What do we do in, an in, in our financial system? Resilience is not even part of the map. 
We only push this one. Nobody will encourage us to guess what will happen. It's called click. And that's called a crash. So that's where the current monetary financial system is. Very efficient. We can congratulate the banking system to be too efficient. <laughs> efficient. <laughs> By the way, just to give you flavor, efficiency measured in terms of volume of transactions that are going on is extraordinary. The foreign exchange to the markets represent $4 trillion per day, $4,000 billion per day. That's more than 50 times the GNP of a day on the world level. We really pushed volume. We really pushed efficiency very nicely. And you're going to have brittleness. As you push efficiency, and by the way, every time there is a crash, what do we do? We save the biggest players, okay? Absorb the smaller ones because it's going to be more efficient. So let's now take the example of what happens when you have a real full blown breakdown. I think the first example in the natural ecosystem. Let's assume that I have an atomic bomb and I throw it over a forest. I come back 50 years later or 100 years later, actually, I've done that in, uh, in some places, and you find an ecosystem. It's not necessarily exactly the same as before, but you have stuff happening. So, what happens? How do you get there? Well, when you have a collapse, a full collapse, you actually end up here. Thousands of different seeds and all kinds of different birds and all stuff drop possible things and some plants start trying to grow and then some of them, it's very inefficient, doesn't have much structure. And then slowly on, some of them adapted, best adapted to the environment, to the quantity of water available to the to the climate and everything else will start doing better and start giving structure to your forest. They start thriving. So they, some of them will climb up until at a certain point you will have entering in a window of viability. That's how nature deals with total collapses. All right? So how do we do it in the financial domain? By the way, in the financial domain we avoided the total meltdown. 2007, 2008, by pumping in this country alone $16 trillion into the economy, more than the GNP, to save it, right? You know the statistics, they were, came up from Bernie Sanders' re amendment, uh, which actually for the first time provides the numbers that uh, of much money was paid. Actually, most people in America seem to believe that when they talk about what it cost to save the banking system the last time, talk about the TARP, right, 700 billion, and the next sentence invariably is, and most of this had been reimbursed, right? Well, we now know the full cost, the full amount that's been pumped in, it's 16.1 trillion. Of course it's possible to reimburse the 700 billion, <laughs> all right? So anyway, so that's where we are. We had some brittleness, you pushed the efficiency very far. By the way, the 10 largest banks have gone from 27% of the market in America to 46%, thanks to the crisis. All right, so we're pushing efficiency. Good. So we have a collapse, let's assume a collapse like Argentina, Russia, Germany in the 1930s, 20s, okay? The great, the, the, the great Depression in the 1930s. That's what we avoided by doing what we just did. So then we get here, and actually you get up, at that time in America, uh, there were thousands, I count of more than 6,000 local currencies. Very inefficient. Survival, barter exchanges on the local level, right? Uh, so what happens, however, Instead of looking which ones go up there, what we do is Roosevelt declared them all illegal, and let's go back to monopoly of reestablishing a monoculture, as before. We have been doing this a lot of times. 
Every one of the crises that I have mentioned, all 421 that I have mentioned so far, have been resolved in this way. Always re-establishing back to the monoculture. So that little loop, I'm just asking how many times do we need to go through it? Is 421 not enough? We can do 422. The newspapers are talking about it these days. Right? When will we wake up? That something else is going on than just bad management. Okay? And I'm not saying, by the way, there's no bad management. But I'm saying, even if it's good management, it won't work. So, are we clear on what's going on? This is the systemic mechanism we're strapped in. And it is due to the fact that we believe that we need to do everything with a single currency every time and reestablish it as quickly as possible if there is a major problem. I'm just telling you that so that when the next one hits, which is not far in the future, remember this. There is another solution. Good. So what we need is a monetary ecology. Okay? And I'm using these words with technical precision. An ecology has systems at different scales. We need, for example, a claim, a global currency that's nobody national currency. The post-dollar world should be a global currency that's nobody's national currency. Right? Uh, but we can also do other currency. I'm going to give in the environment here. I've about, my major problem in this topic is choose. To choose what? I have about 50 examples to give you. And obviously, I don't, I'm not going to tell you all 50. Otherwise, we'll be here until next week. Right? So I'm going to give you three examples. Given that we are in a learning institution, let's talk about a learning currency. Okay? I'm also claiming that it's time to actually give the possibility for city-based currencies because the cities are struggling like hell to survive and it's going to get a lot worse soon. So, and then we've got some examples of social purpose things. And my key message for the young people here is create your own. Okay? That's what I'm doing. By the way, I've been starting systems around the world. There are well over 5,000 systems today, okay, which are not commercial. Right? Good. Let's start with the, with the learning idea. Um, this is based on research that was done in the States in the 70s and in the 80s. It's called the learning pyramid. And uh, the argument that has been developed is that retained learning, in other words, what you remember after the exam, okay, not necessarily to pass the exam, but what you remember after the exam is 5% of a lecture. And if you read a paper or, or a book, it's going to be 10%. It's better. However, we're going to have a little discussion group. Wait, as soon as I finish here, because that part will remember 50%. But the best way is for you to teach her, and you will remember 90% for the rest of your life, what you taught others. So an entire education system from kindergarten all the way to university is upside down. We are training the teachers to know everything <laughs> by giving them repeated functions of doing this. We should put them upside down. Good. I'm back from Lithuania, was there a month and a half ago. And uh, what's interesting in Lithuania is uh, the president, that's a small country, about three million people, Baltic country. And the president, who is the first time a woman, by the way, uh, has declared that uh, she wants people to come and visit Lithuania in order to learn something. An interesting idea. By the way, uh, I mean, she couldn't really say they should come to the warm beaches, right? And she couldn't really say, you know, we should, you know, have people visit the pyramids. 
or Greek temples or, you know, even medieval cathedrals. There aren't such things. So what do they have in Lithuania? There aren't such things. So what do they have in Lithuanians? Well, there are two things they have. One of them, in 2010, they surpassed Sweden to be the most cable, uh, optical wired country in the world. Okay? That's something, right? And the second thing, they have mobile phones, 120% penetration of the population. In other words, there are a number of people who have more than one. Okay? So that's the basis on which what I'm presenting next has been developed. The objective is, as a learning country, well, 2030. All people below 40 need to be trilingual. Not many foreigners will learn Lithuanian. Let's be serious, right? So, you know. And the other language that they, many educated people know is Russian, okay? Because they were under the part of the Soviet system for 70 years. So uh, now they would actually believe that it would be nice to learn some other languages, like perhaps uh, English or Chinese or German or something else that, you know. So that's one of the objectives. The other thing is, well, they have this, but are they using it well? And there's also intergenerational learning that they want to achieve. So how, what I'm going to be presenting is what had been designed with them six, six weeks ago, eight seven, eight, seven weeks ago. The next meeting for this stuff is in January, where the implementation will start. How it starts? Well, you have a citizen, and you have a dream. And this is a dream machine. They have a dream. Let me give you real examples. One of them was a 17-year-old in my audience there. And his dream was to learn Zen meditation in, Bur in uh, Burma. And I don't know why in Burma. Uh, but, I mean, you could understand Zen meditation, but Burma is less to live in the mountains, actually, there. I was wondering why, but fine. We didn't ask the question why, but that's his dream. There was also a girl there whose dream is to spend the weekend with her hero. She's a Nobel Prize of Physics. Okay? And there's a whole group there that wanted to learn sailing at the level necessary to go around the world. Well, these are dreams. What we're going to be doing is to create a machine that makes those, real, those dreams real. Fine. And this will be done through the Lithuanian Learning Foundation. We're going to create a DORA, is the economy, and DORALAND is the system. The foundation makes a contract with the citizen, with that 17 year old. Say, all right, we'll get you to Lithuania, sorry, we'll get you to, to Burma, and we'll find your Zen master in the mountains and get you there. Uh, but you need to bring 3,000 doras. And I asked, he was fluent in English, so he said, well, he would be willing to teach people at the same level of English he himself has. And I asked him, would he be willing to train 20 people? He said, no problems. I said, 50 people? He said, I'd do anything. Right? So, fine. We'll get him 3,000 hours of teaching English. And he will do that, and he really likes his dream. For the girl, it's a little easier. Well, it's 2,000. Now, how do you earn those doras? Well, in the case of the... The 17-year-old, it is teaching English, for example. But we'll give other examples. And the other bit mobilized the entire nonprofit world. Nonprofits, many of them are involved in actually learning, teaching. Not necessarily class environment. If you want to become ecologically aware, well, there's a way of learning how to become ecologically operational, how to reduce your energy consumption. All these things can be learned. So, they will all be involved, and they organize the activities of learning outside of the school system, right? They play the same role that businesses, for-profit businesses, do in the conventional economy. Now, this is important here, because the non-profits, 
spending their time actually raising money and fighting each other like hell with a smile in order to get the dollars. They cannot collaborate because of that. In Lithuania we create an economy, a learning economy funded by Doras, which is actually not costing anything to the government. And they can collaborate. So, when I have enough Doras, I have my 3,000, then the foundation gets the airplane ticket, has organized finding out who the Zen master is, and put the contact together. For the kid who wants to spend with the Nobel Prize of Physics, it's a couple of phone calls perhaps from the Minister of Education saying this girl has spent 2,000 hours teaching, blah, blah, whatever, in order to see you. He would be open to meet them. <laughs> you see the point? And this thing may be sponsored. You may be sure that when they come back, the media will be there. So the airline is going to be very happy to say, this was sponsored by blah, blah, blah. Right? So you can actually have the entire system cost-free. Or practically cost-free. I'm not saying national currency free. Okay? But you don't need the government to pay for it. You can get sponsorships for it. So that's the project of a learning currency. Okay. I don't understand. Who feeds the citizen? Who feeds the citizen? That young man on his way to Burma. How does he eat? Well, this is a complementary system. Okay. We are not getting rid of the lita, which is the national currency. Okay. This is in addition to the dollars, in addition to the euros, in addition to other things. This is a separate system. It's not with that that you're going to be eating. Okay? With this you'll be learning. <laughs> okay, let's go on. One way of learning, of getting them, is the teenagers will teach adults how to use the internet. And the teenagers and the adults earn Doras. And if an adult doesn't need the Doras, no problems. He can give them to his favorite kid. Uh, there's also a program for Younger kids, less than 12 years old. It's called the National Wisdom Archive. You have kids from primary school interviewing the adults, the elderly people over 75, with one question. What have you learned in your lifetime that is useful for the 21st century? And if you introduce just an audio tape, you get 50 doras. If you produce a multimedia product with the pictures and the sounds and the, you know, the music of the time period that he's referring to, you get 200 doras. And every year we have a competition for the 10 best contributions to the archive and they get 1,000 doras. Cost to the government. <laughs> Start seeing the point? We can do things at another scale than just convincing you to take the same airline. But it's the same idea. All right, second idea. Here was a voluntary system. Now we're going to be dealing with a system that deal with the tough times that we're in, cities. How do we function today in a city or in a state, you know, in this country or a county, uh, with a single currency? Well, you have your national currency, dollars, which is created as bank debt, it's competitive and they are scarce. By the way, I'm quoting from a monetary theory textbook when saying, bank debt money needs to be scarcer than its usefulness. Otherwise, it have hyperinflation. So, can I start seeing the implications of why we're kind of artificially having some scarcity? Okay, so that currency, is used in the global economy, to, and that's where financial capital is built. We have a cooperative, regional, city economy of a social level where social capital is occurring. And here where the nonprofits work, right? So how do we get there? How do we get resources from there to here? Two ways. Nonprofits who get tax deductions, or city raises taxes, and with that raises subsidies. Now, 
Taxes have never been popular anywhere in history. So consequence, this is starved to death. This is never developed. And you see it in lots of domains. What I'm proposing is this. A bicycle with two wheels. Someone have to think about it, you know, with a bicycle too. The first bicycles were with a single wheel, and it's possible. But it kind of requires a bit of a circus number, right? To keep the stability. So what do we do? We have a normal economy where taxes are being raised on profits made in, in, in dollars, and that's all okay, that's what we keep on doing. But there's a second thing that's possible. The city can require from its citizens a contribution in an other form than dollars. And it could be, let's, I'll call them contributions. I'm using a word specially, pur purposely different. But it's an obligation. It's like military duty. Or in Holland, they're using this, their civic duty. Okay? And this city issues that currency without interest. So it can basically say every household needs to bring 20 civics. And here's the list of the type of activities that we want to encourage. And here is the list of nonprofit organizations that actually can organize that for you. And you choose what it is. Is it sustainability? Is it learning? Is it intergenerational relationships? Whatever it is. But someone, everybody has to contribute something. Now, let's assume that you all guys are very conscious, socially conscious, and ecologically conscious, and you've made, you're earning a lot of civics. I'm one of those guys who doesn't have the time or no interest, and I'm, fine. I'm not doing any of this. Fine. At the end of the year, I need to find 20 civics. So we create an eBay, which actually, where I can have buy people who have an excess. Now, the exchange rate is left open. And I recommend it to be a floating open rate, because if you don't, it's going to have a black market. <laughs> Okay, let's be real. However, if you want to increase it, it's very simple. Instead of to ask 20, ask for 50. Yeah? But it's possible to make a living here. Which is not a job. It's something you like doing. You see the point? You're getting out of the box. Okay. So this would solve the starvation of cities when you try to do everything with... By the way, there's another exit door. Eh? Let's assume that a city wants to be, okay, green, okay? Uh, well, they make a budget of what it will cost. It will cost so many hundreds of millions of dollars over the next five years to have this part of Manhattan becoming, quote unquote, green in whatever your criteria. That you pay all the salaries and all that stuff the normal way. That will mean, say, $2,000 per, per household per year. Well, fine. You don't want to play this game? No problems. Pay $2,000 and you're out of the system, okay? Actually, for 20 civics, it's not bad pay, <laughs> all right? You see my point? You create another economy, parallel. And again, the NGOs can play the role that businesses do, just like in the Dora land. By the way, in order to avoid the, the fraud, make this completely transparent. There's no reason why you should hide where you earned your doors and whether you got them as a gift from your mom or whatever. That's the best way of policing it. And use the mobile phone as your account number. So we have a system. What I'm talking about has the following implications. And I'm generalizing. Making one of the key conclusions here. For people who are financially wealthy, they can keep on being financially wealthy, but not at the expense of humanity. And for people who are not financially wealthy, this gives a possibility to manifest, to develop your gifts, and to contribute them to society in a much wider range than the commercial game. The commercial game is not going to be the source for survival economically. That's the message. And I give you a couple of examples of how to do that. Voluntarily or at the city level, 
just like any other obligation. Now, Japan has the fastest aging population on the planet. Second country is Italy, actually. When you have an aging problem, and it, what we know is that it requires, there are now 1.8 million people that need daily care in Japan. This will double over the next 10 years. Try to do that with normal money, it won't work. There are only two solutions in the conventional way, in, in the box. The first solution is, we have a pie of a certain size, more and more people need to eat from it, let's cut the slices smaller and smaller. Maybe that way they die quicker, but we don't say that, right? And the second solution is, well, let's call it the Scandinavian solution or the German solution. We made a promise. We keep our promise. Let's go bankrupt. Okay? The third solution is Japan. They created a currency. It's called the Furiakipu, which means a caring relationship ticket. One hour of a service to an elderly person or a handicapped person, you get a credit in a savings account, an electronic savings account. And when you have a flu, you can call and someone picks up your kids or someone picks up medication. Or you can send your credits to your mom who lives in another part of the country. And someone will take care of her in the same way. Everything that's not covered by national health care is covered in Furiakipu in Japan. Everything. Shopping. Food preparation. It reduces the cost to society. Why? The elderly person breaks her leg. That's called the universal health care is taken care of there, so that's paid in yen. But she can go back home faster because there's a network in place to do the shopping for her. Okay? You see the system? Anyway, there are 478 systems operational in Japan and there are two clearinghouses. I believe it's part of our future. This is another system. There are 65 radio systems in Germany of which 40 are currently operational. This is one of the, this was the second one chronologically, the Kimgauer in Bavaria. It's a currency with a parking fee to activate circulation. The opposite of interest. Interest gives you an incentive to accumulate the stuff and keep it. This is actually a pure medium of exchange, not a store of value. This is an American invention by my friend uh, Edgar Kahn in uh, Washington, uh, the time dollar system. They also call it time banking now. Uh, it's mutual credit. I do something for you, I have a credit, you have a debit. If you were doing something back for me, that would be barter, right? However, if with my credit, I can get a massage from Helen, and you can work in his garden, we've created a currency between the four of us, and it is insufficiency. It's not scarce. There's no constraint on the availability of the currency. This is systems in Japan. Another system in Japan at the inauguration of the Yamato Love. Yamato is a city of 300,000 people uh, south, northeast of uh, Tokyo. Um, that was me before my beard. <laughs> uh, they have set up an electronic system run by the city for people to start their own currency system. When you have an idea of what you want to do with a currency, you ask at the mayor's office and they send you the packages of cards, with smart cards, to actually start your system. The payment system is provided as a public service. The word, everything is in Japanese except the word love. It stands for local value exchange. Okay? So, there are other examples, many. As I said, at least I can tell you another 50. But I'll give you just one, a couple of other examples. How many of you have heard of the weir? Oh, good, good. At least three. That's, you know, progress. Um, did you know how, that Switzerland has two currencies since 1934? It has the Swiss franc and it has the weir. A quarter of all businesses in Switzerland use the weir. And that system that nobody ever talks about, even in Switzerland, by the way, except the members, uh, is actually the secret for the stability of the Swiss economy. 
You've noticed that Switzerland is more stable than its neighbors, right? So, you know, why is an Italian living in the southern tip of, of Switzerland different from the one on the other side, or talking to the French? I mean, God forbid, the French. You know, they go in Switzerland and the economy is different. Believe me, it's not because of the banks. The banks actually are creating a problem, <laughs> frankly, okay? Um, no, the secret is not the mountains, because otherwise the Himalayas would be a heaven of stability. It's not the cows, otherwise Wisconsin would be fantastic. And I swear it's not the chocolates, because otherwise Belgium would be perfect. <laughs> okay, I am from Belgium, so I have to have my, <laughs> my pitch. Um, it is that stupid little currency that nobody talks about, because it is counter-cyclical. It automat what happens when the Swiss economy calms down, the Swiss francs get scarcer, the volume of beer increases, the number of participants increases. And they are in mutual credit. I do some sell something for you, you have a credit, you have a debit. Right? The C3, it's currently operational in Uruguay and in Brazil. It's a system to inject working capital in small businesses. This is the solution for unemployment. Employment is created by small businesses. 85 to 90 percent of all private jobs are in small businesses. Small businesses are strangled because of working capital. Why? When they sell something, they have to pay. They get paid in 90 days or 120 days. When they buy, they have to pay cash for 30 days. When you go to the bank, you're too small to be interesting. So that's a problem universal. That problem has been solved. I'm not going to get into the details, but it works. Uh, the Terra. I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation. We need a global currency that's an open international currency. This is a currency that has been designed to make it profitable to think long term. I'm, okay, I'm not going to get into the mechanics. It's a half an hour presentation. Uh, Brazil has studied, the Central Bank of Brazil has studied for 10 years the Banco Palma system in uh, Fortaleza, in the Northeast, has concluded two things. Number one, this is not creating any problems for management of the national currency. Number two, this solves problems, particularly poverty and job creation, that otherwise we can't do. They're now launching 200 dual currency banks. Right now. Etc., etc., etc. So let me get to the conclusion. Twenty years from now, probably ten years from now, we'll be looking back at this period with unbelief. It was going to be as looked at as stupid as what they did at the beginning of the railroad time. They had one single track for trams, trails going both ways. <laughs> and of course that can create a problem. Well, we are having deficit reductions because we need to pay back governmental debt in dollars. And we have vital needs, like ensuring that we go over to the post-carbon economy, and they are on the same track, and they are going to hit. The next step in the crisis, this is not a leftist French newspaper. It's The Economist. Okay? In other words, we can look at it in a picture. <laughs> you can start from the top or from the bottom or from the right or from the left and you can have a lot of political debate about it, whether it should be the right or the left, but the point is, well, it's said clearly. There's a third reason. All patriarchal societies in history, and by the way, if you want to know whether you're in a patriarchal society, you know what the shortcut is? Look at the vision of the divine. If the divine is a single guy with a beard who has done it all without a girlfriend, <laughs> you are in a patriarchal society. Welcome. Okay? Uh, so all patriarchal societies in history, we're talking China, we're talking Sumer, Babylon, the Greeks, the Romans, and since the Renaissance, 
us in Western civilization, have all imposed a single national currency. A single, not national, a single currency. Okay, top down, with interest. Interest was invented before writing. Writing was invented to register financial transactions. Okay, so <laughs> unfortunately not for love letters. Okay, so a monopoly of a centralized currency with interest has some positive things, and let's acknowledge that, it should be emphasizing. The Industrial Revolution would never have happened had we not had that system. We would never have been able to. There is not a single railroad that started in someone's garden. There's not a single steel mill that started in someone's garage. Okay? By the way, interestingly enough, in the computer age, that's not the case. You know, some people start computer systems in their garage. Okay? So we are in a different society. But we keep on believing with the single currency. Now, it also has a couple of problems. Booms and bust cycles. And it has concentration of wealth, which is a logical consequence. What is interest? It's a systematic transfer of people who don't have enough money to people who have more than they need. And it is incompatible with the community. If you have not figured that out, let me just give you a suggestion for the next time of your girlfriend's or your wife's uh, birthday, uh, give her a $100 bill and say that's, that's for, that's, you know, happy birthday. <laughs> okay? It won't work. Okay? Uh, another way of putting it is on a negative terms, you take a normal happily family, that's working nicely together. You bring $10 million, put it on the table, come back two weeks later. Everybody's fighting. Okay? Now, matrifocal societies are different. By the way, matrifocal, I'm using the word focal, not matriarchal, for the simple reason that matriarchy has never existed. In a matriarchal society, you would have the male reduced to the role of procreation. That hasn't happened, except with the Amazons, which was an invention of the Greeks. There's never been a place where they found an Amazon society, archaeologically or otherwise. So, in matrifocal societies like Egypt, the nice role is played by Isis, as you may remember. Osiris is a poor guy who gets in trouble all the time, and she saves him repeatedly out of love, right? And the central Middle Ages, the Black Madonnas, the time period where all the cathedrals were built, were time periods where matrifocal societies were active in our in our civilization. You always had dual currency systems in matrifocal societies. You had one currency, identical to this one, to trade the people you don't know, long distance. The Egyptians traded with gold rings with Mesopotamia, with Greek coins, with the Greeks. But they had a second currency system. Bottom up, no interest, the opposite of interest, the mirage, the parking fee on money, a pure medium of exchange. In the case of Egypt, it was based on wheat, storage, food. And the cost of storing was actually the Dumbarash fee. Uh, that second currency was used for local exchanges. And was also insufficiency. Now, the consequence was economic stability for centuries. The little people the beat up the bottom of the social pyramid, were living best in those societies. I was very shocked to discover that we all know that we're taller than our parents and our grandparents, right? And we attribute that because we've been in a good period. You know, we've been growing up at a period where there was well-being. Uh, the city of London is the only place that I've found so far that has actually a track record because of the tube. They unearthed bodies all over London. It's been a place that inhabited from prehistoric times to the Romans through, you know, to the day. <laughs> okay. They measured the size of the bodies. The women were tallest in London in the 12th century. One centimeter taller than today. And the man caught up with the 12th century in the last 30 years. So the living, standard of living is better. 
And finally, it is compatible with the community. And the final reason is, if you read the papers, you will notice that they're running out of ideas. Now, let me tell you where that leads on the basis of historical record. The last time we were in the situation we are now was in the 30s. Political polarization, sounds familiar? And ends up with souls by war. Roosevelt himself noted that it wasn't the New Deal that saved America out of the Depression. That's one word, too. So I think it's time to understand what we're dealing with. And because of the instability that we are having, the time to be aware that there is a possibility. The time to change will be when there is dislocation. Small systems have been tried. They're already operational. There are thousands of them, small scale. We can gear up to another level. And this will provide another path than the one we're in. If you try to do everything with a single currency, you're overloading the donkey. There's another way. <laughs> the balance between the masculine and the feminine is not a question of justice. It's a question of survival of our species. And when you're dealing with a currency that only promotes masculine values, you're not going to get there. Other currencies that I've been talking about can promote the other balance. I have two books in English in America out today. This is with my co-author Gwendolyn, who is a city planner. This is a how-to book. Okay? It really deals with what do you do at a city level. There are nine forms of capital. How do you develop these nine forms of capital? With what kind of systems? There are 50 different types of systems explained in that book. This is a more recent book. It's available electronically right now. This is the one that gives the evidence for what I've been talking about for the first time in English of the matrifocal versus the patriarchal systems and the historical evidence and the theoretical philosophical basis for it. So thank you very much for your attention. It's a little bit misleading to, to, to say that a, a patriarchal society kind of like favors males. I think males are more enslaved in, in a patriarchal society I, than, than, uh, than, than, than females. But that's, that's, uh, you know, I, that's, They're differently enslaved. Yes. yes. We agree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but, 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 but it I understand. makes us think that But I didn't say that. I'm just making clear that I didn't say that. Yeah. I'm only talking about the money system. I, I, I <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, there, there is another concept that was um, heralded in the late 19th century by an economist called uh, Henry George and was yes. sidelined in the, in the, by the academia. Correct. And actually, J.P. Clark, the founder of the American Association of Economics, and a professor here had monumental debates with Henry George about the, the mm. fallacies of the yeah. classical economic system. Now, Henry George said that that basically the money system is, is irrelevant. Like if I have a system where I charge more than I, my production cost, then I'm going to have a, a concentration. So he proposed the so-called land value taxation, which is basically the, 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 the rental values, whatever I collect above the production value, basically belongs to the community. So the rent we pay, that's our taxes. Yeah. And the rental value is way more than our government needs. So even within the current system, uh, if we implemented that solution, maybe that, that, would, be yes. that, that, I, uh, that would be a solution that has not been tried and that won't be your yeah. uh, comment. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm familiar with uh, uh, George's work. Uh, there are two things uh, that I find a limiting factor in what he's saying. First of all, he also based the economy fundamentally on land. And he tied it in with land reform. Anyway, fine. Okay, I know that's not what you're saying, but I'm saying he is not quite into the post-industrial age. He's actually in the pre-industrial age in that sense. She was in the late 19th century. 
Yeah. 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 No, no, but, but his emphasis was on, well, he had one aspect with the whole land reform, connecting with land reform. And the second thing is, the kind of society and organization and control system that you need to implement what he's talking about is basically very, very government-based. You have to, you know, everything that the rent needs to be skimmed off. Who will determine how it's skimmed off, right? So what I'm talking about is different. It gets to a similar objective, but it does it with a lot more bottom-up initiatives. Basically, what I'm communicating here if you don't like any of the examples I gave you, or that I've described, no problem, start your own. You can't do that with Georgia Reform. Okay? In other words, you need to have a big boss to make it work. And I think big boss is not the model for the future at this time. That's my bias, let's put it that way. Thank you. Any other question? Either it was so convincing, or I, everybody fell asleep. The former? Okay, thank you. That's generous of you. So what is your question? <laughs> remember, this is the time to actually learn and remember better. Because if you're going to have a little debate about this stuff, yeah. you're going to remember better. What you uh, said, how, how will, or how supportive Kichengu governments then be of a, you know, fostering and supporting more parallel currency systems, knowing that you know the, the system that you talked about was the currency system on four. There's no tax to be collected because there's no you know value added tax for the government to to collect. So how, okay. how do you think the government or how do you think governments will be supportive or not about? These systems perform the functions without costing taxes. There are currently 41 states in the United States of America that are funding the startup of time dollar systems to solve local problems on their own staff because it solves problems cheaper than trying to do it in the conventional way. Okay? So, by the way, you know, only some of these systems require government intervention. Okay? The only one that I have actually presented it is the, the civic, okay? The other ones are all bottom-up systems. You don't need the government. Uh, and the government, as it solves problems that the government otherwise would have to spend money on, would be very stupid to kill it. Now, some countries do. Let me put it more generically. I claim that in the information age, all countries in the world are developing countries. Some of them are in denial, some of them are not. Some countries that still believe that we are in the information age, that we're not in the information age, that we can still deal with the systems the way they were in the industrial age, will become the developing countries of the 21st century. We have a precedent for this. It's China in the 19th century. At the beginning of the 19th century, China decided that railroads and steel mills were barbarian stuff, which they were. They were ugly and they were smelly and they were destroying landscapes and all that stuff. Fine. So they decided to say no. They became the most, the, 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 the most sophisticated developing country of the 20th century. Right? This is a tool to shift to another organization of society. A society with the tools that we have available in the 21st century, the information age tools. Some countries will refuse it, and it's their problem. That's the way I look at it. So, and the way to kill it would be to require a value-added tax, for example, the services delivered for learning. Well, then do it with classical stuff and put sponsorships and, you know, the go to universities where it costs you thirty or fifty thousand dollars a year to learn. That's one way. Good luck. There will be lots of people that will not be educated. That's the other consequence. But just on a very basic level, so if if I cut your hair and you wash my car, there's no normally if you uh, do it through invoices and through companies, there's some money that 
the government collects. But if we do it on a basa basis, there's no tax. So how, how would the government... That is actually not true. Uh, yeah. No, 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 I'm just saying. Uh, when you're dealing with commercial exchanges, which is what you're describing, you pay taxes on it. In the United States, there is a particular form that you fill in when you have those transactions. And that's it. There are 550 businesses that are in America that are doing barter. Now, okay? Billions of dollars are being changed. This is even global. The counter trade system is now 15 billion, sorry, 15, uh, yeah, 15 percent of global trade is done without money, without conventional money. You pay your taxes on it. Let's be clear. But the kind of stuff that we should be, to give you the counter example, the time dollar that I mentioned briefly is officially three times in the United States being ruled by IRS as being tax exempt. Why? Because it solves social problems outside of the market system. About the inclusiveness of the program introduced, because uh, the example you listed, the uh, Japan example as a time dollar example, it seems to me that only the people who are really interested in that service will participate in, the, in, in that program. So as I as I consider, like non-monetary incentives would not be like as available to everyone. So how would you encourage as many people to participate in this program as people who are not interested in this service would not be included? Yeah. In the case of Japan, the system is. I mean, I looked at the Furiakipu in some detail. And what I found, what was interesting, the motivation behind it is actually a very cultural one. When you're, are you Japanese? Oh, okay, sorry, Chinese, all right, fine, okay, good. Uh, in Japan, and I believe it's probably true in China too, if you are not in a position of taking care of your parents, you are guilty, right? So in other words, let's assume you have a job in New York and your, parent, your, your mother lives in, you know, somewhere in the countryside, you are feeling guilty not to be able to take care of her. And that is actually the motivation system in the case of Japan. Now, what's interesting, I warned about that when it was introduced in, in Europe. Uh, now there's this one city that is, has introduced it in Europe, and it's called in St. Gallen in Switzerland. And there was a change that was required, which is not necessary in Japan. And the change was that the city actually guaranteed that the time units that you accumulate will be available for services when you need them in the future. So the motivation in Europe is not the guilt for not being for your parents. It is, you know, well, I'm going to do this. I am now, you know, fit and happy. I'm willing to help other people. But when I am going to be needing help, I want to make sure that it is. And the city has guaranteed it. And in fact, what's interesting, the reason they have guaranteed it is, in fact, they're stuck with it anyway, right? Isn't that what Social Security is supposed to be? Pardon? Isn't that what Social Security in this country is Social Security, I don't think, will take care of shopping when you actually have broken a leg and uh, you're... I mean, some services Social Security is trying to do. And by the way, I'm not against, nothing against Social Security. I'm just saying it's not going to cover everything that's needed. That's all. Yes, and I'm saying is we're going to have a quarter of the population over 65, it won't work. That's all. Just add up the numbers. <laughs> you know, it won't hold. There are two ways of doing it. Okay? Uh, one of them is volunteering. And let me tell you where we have experience in this country. There was a study done by the University of Maryland uh, on the Institute of Aging on that topic. When you have a community, uh, an area where you do have a time dollar system or, a, or another kind of local currency, two things happen. First of all, for the NGOs, the nonprofit, the, 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 the nonprofit organizations, the biggest problem they usually have is the, uh, the turnover. Volunteers are happy to do volunteering for six months or a year, but you, know, you need to retrain your staff every year, almost 80, 90% for an out. Okay? So this system suddenly drops to 10%. Why? Because it is acknowledged. Because it is measured. The very simple fact that the time is measured makes a difference 
in terms of being willing to do it longer. It's strange, psychological. It's, a, it's, a, it's, an, it's an hour. It's, it's a watch. <laughs> well, would you believe that that computer that I have here, okay, that little computer there, has 10 times the capacity of the computer center that I ran at the Central Bank of Belgium that ran the whole payment system of the country? Okay, and it required 110 people to make it work. Right? A little computer does it. It's, it's all. You have a non-profit. Okay. The conventional system is not terribly transparent. Okay? You know, you know, nobody. Before I deal with you, I can see your account. Yeah, but if you and I get behind the door and close the door... Okay. And, and I, and all right. Now, fantastic. You've cheated. You've got 100 national credits. What the hell will you do with it? <laughs> You're going to find 10 times more sick? In order to need more services? Okay. I mean, what's the point? You're not going to buy a car with this. <laughs> right? I mean, this is, you know, yeah. human relationship stuff. <laughs> Why would you bother? <laughs> you know, what will you do with a million Fure Kipu? You know, nothing. <laughs> but but your, other, your other currencies are transferable to... Dep well, it depends which one. The civic. The civic, total transparency. In other words, your bank account is your mobile phone, and that you know I can anybody can know where you earned them, who got it for what purpose, and they are not alone. And we have we set up a non-profit organization in the Dora system. We're going to set one non-profit organization whose business is to audit the trail of the Doras, just like you have an audit system in the conventional system. And this is a non-profit that's paid in Doras in order to do the audits of the Doras. Amen. That's what we do there. For the presentation, and, and I, I was personally involved with creating Brooklyn Condal. Brooklyn Dollars was actually in it, and we had been going for about three years, but it never went further. Uh, and I was also involved with a, a, a time share, yes. a woman chair, that, that worked for a while. It still exists. Point B, when I think about these things, yes, the idea is that they're exciting and, and it makes sense, and then they're about how do you scale it up? There Good is question. an ox being gored there. That ox is that, that 1%. And, uh, you know. All systems, uh, whether it's local exchange trading systems, which there are over a thousand in the world, uh, LETS, which were invented initially in Canada, uh, there are over a thousand of those, which are local systems, or time dollars, they all reach about 500 families. They stay at that level. Now, that's nothing wrong with that, from my perspective, in the sense that I compare them to capillaries. You know, capillary vessels in your blood distribution, it gives you color, it keeps you warm, but it won't replace a heart attack. It won't deal, deal with a heart attack, right? So we're actually getting to dealing with heart attack issues. So the kind of systems I've been talking about are scalable. The DORA can be scaled to a country. The Civic can be, can be, can be scaled to the entire United States. Okay? I'm suggesting to do it decentralized okay? for democratic reasons because you, know, you don't want to have Congress deciding what you spend your time on. Okay? I mean, you know, we have actually experience in Bali. Anybody has been in Bali? Okay. What have you noticed in Bali? I would say you have not seen one Balinese beggar. You have seen Javanese begging or prostitution. You have not seen the... I didn't no, well, fine. Well, fine. I'm just saying, I spent four months there, okay? So I looked at it. Bali is the example that we have of a matrifocal society that has been doing a dual currency system all the way to today since at least 845 AD, which is the first time that it was mentioned. And it was mentioned the first time because writing was introduced for the first time. It's older than that. They have a dual currency system. And every adult Balinese spends a third of his life, and that's what you were actually alluding to, into the yin economy, as I call it, the yin-yang concept from Taoism, the feminine economy, the community economy. They are deciding, at, there are 3,000 systems, local administration systems called banyars, 
where people decide what they do every month. They what projects we will deal with. And they decide, making two budgets, one in national currency and one in time. And everybody contributes the same amount, but they have a voice in what it is that they will do. And it will do all kinds of extraordinary feasts that you must have seen. I mean, you know, we are, or, or Christmas idea is kind of a joke compared to what they do in Bali. I mean, it's extraordinary extravaganza of beauty that's being created for one day. You know, they have these very elaborate things. The hours that are spent in this is extraordinary. But a third of a Balinese life spent in that thing, in that other economy. That explains the resilience of that society. It's the only country that has more tourists than inhabitants and keeps its culture intact, or at least surviving. The rule of thumb typically is that when you have more than a third of the population in annual visits of tourism, whether it's in Hawaii, Italy in the 19th century, Greece in the 19th century, Fiji, the, natural, the, convention, the traditional system disappears. The dances in Hawaii are performed in the hotels. Gone. There are 2,700 dancing teams in Bali. 23 are commercial. All the other 2,600 and some are still templatine. And this is after decades of, you know, millions of visitors every year. So we create another culture. We create another society. It's a demonstration case. But what I learned there, the Indonesians tried to introduce the Balinese system in Java. But the government decide what it is that they would need to do. You build your road to get to your town. Uh -uh. Not working. You need to have input from the bottom up. People need to choose what they want to do. And when you have that, you have the commitment for it. And then it works. You mentioned the social context. Yes. And uh, a lot of the examples that you, you've given are very um, advanced countries, Switzerland, Japan, Lithuania. Um, I'm wondering if there's a history or attempts at introducing this kind of dual currency into rapidly urbanizing situations, informal settlements, slums, as a way of uh, organizing economic activity or social development. And uh, because the, the, the introduction of uh, kind of the unrivaled capitalistic economies into these informal settlements yeah. creates a very rapacious environment where development is very chaotic. So I'm wondering if there are examples of that that you've seen. There are examples of it. Uh, there were some systems in Senegal, for example, that were developed on that basis. Now, what I have noticed uh, in, in Asia, in, in Thailand, they have several systems that are working bottom-up. Uh, the, uh, the, the reason that I suspect that, we, that the answer should be yes is that mobile phones are universal. And the future of payment systems in dollars, as everything else, is mobile phones. So there is no reason to not consider that option, okay? And what I have been trying to do is convince Yunus to connect, I mean, not just do microcredit loans in national money, which is very expensive, 27% interest rate. How many projects can you have by introducing that second system, okay? Uh, so uh, there's also a paper which is available on my website on a savings currency that's based on trees, okay? That would be, that was designed for India, okay? So the answer is yes. What I have noticed very often is that central governments in developing countries uh, are afraid of initiatives from the bottom up. That's where the hurdle is. Because they believe that if they're going to start organizing themselves, they'll do it, you know, against them. <laughs> uh, so that's actually the reason that I suspect it has been delayed. But I don't think it will be stopped because the mobile phones are there already. Yes? Uh, I didn't want to answer. But I was um, very curious if I could see three examples yes. in Brazil where um, they're using this alternate currency system to provide working capital to small businesses yes. and employment. But how would that work? I mean, 
that seems like it would by necessity have to work with the conventional currency system. It does. Okay. It's actually a convertible weir. Okay? But how do you create a convertibility? Let's assume a small business. Lisa is my big client, obviously, right? So she has an, have an invoice for her. She's IBM or she is the city of New York or something like that. Fine. She's going to pay me $100,000 in three months' time. Okay, with this $100,000, I get an insurance that if she doesn't pay in 90 days, the insurance company will pay and, she, and the insurance company will go after her. I'm off the hook, right? I introduce that insured invoice into a network, computerized network, and I get immediately 100,000 C3s. With that, I can pay you or you immediately. 90 days go by. She pays her bill because she's a serious lady. And, <laughs> and at that point, all the C3 units that were created on the basis of that invoice can be convertible into national currency without interest cost. In the meantime, you can also get normal money, but then you pay the interest and the banking fees because actually you get into factoring for those who are familiar with this system. Okay? Answer the question? Yes. Just multiple systems alone address the issue of inequality unless it makes it so that I guess we're more comfortable with collapse. For instance, you have that chart in your slide that shows the arrows going back and forth between efficiency and I think resilience. Yes. And it always bounces back towards the monopoly yes. structure. But it seems like that happens because of the level of inequality, because the haves have so much that they can corrupt the democracy or whatever it is the government has to push out the little people and just eat them up and get bigger and win. So until you address until you become more comfortable with complete collapse of the dominant yeah. in the system, maybe that is at the point of the multiple structures that we won't fear chaos in the event of the big ones collapsing because there's going to be smaller ones? Or uh, does that? So now, I would say that happens because of inequality. What? I would say that happens because of the level of inequality. No. I think it happens because of the power of the lobby of the banking system. I have never met any monopolist who doesn't enjoy the monopoly and doesn't want to keep it, right? So in other words, what happens here is the result of lobbying, right? They went to be here. They went to be back to the monopoly. So that's what happened in the 30s, right? And that's what happened in 2010 in this country. After the big meltdown, you had three lobbyists for every elected person in Washington working full-time for the banking system. So the result is zero changes. Right? That's the problem. By the way, it is, from a theoretical perspective, we call this uh, autocatalytic systems. Okay? This is actually an autocatalytic process in the financial system. The people who have the, you know, a lot of money have the capacity to influence laws better than ordinary people, that I will give them more money. Now, that will go to a certain point. But historically, we know that if you push it too far, it blows up. Okay? The French Revolution was made on that. The American Revolution was made on that. Isn't, wasn't that also Marx's analysis? <sighs> Marx didn't understand complex theory, I think, and he was in the box of a single currency. Okay? So, in other words, I think that the, the real critical difference in what I'm trying to convey is the, the, the trap is the idea of a single currency, not what that currency is, who manages it, what are the rules, all that stuff is useful, but it will not get you out of the monoculture. I'm not arguing about, I'm not saying we shouldn't improve the other systems, and we shouldn't, you know, have transparency and all that stuff, all, all the stuff that people talk about, but I'm saying it's not enough. Currency that we would uh, that would be implemented is that can you make a profit in that currency or is it just something that's exchanged? Well, it depends what system. Lucky, let me give you an example of the C3 that I just described earlier. That is definitely a for-profit currency. How about the Dora? The Dora, well, the purpose. Okay, you earn the currency in order to realize your dream. You can call that a profit if you want but actually you don't have a Dora cost. 
the person that, okay, when, when a teenager trains uh, someone at the computer, the adult and the teenager both get Doras. It does not have to be at the expense of the elderly person, right? So in other words, there's no competition here. So it's not profit in that sense, because profit is a difference between cost and, and interest, income. In this case, it's a different game. So there are systems that depends on how you design the system, basically. And one of the nice things about this game that I'm proposing that you create yourself is you invent the game. Okay? And if it's a good game, it will develop. It will blossom. The Dora did not exist two months ago. Okay? So. <laughs> All right. I think. <laughs>